Tim Knowlton, Doctor of Public Health, is Senior Scientist with the Health and Environment Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council, where she leads the Global Warming and Health Project. She is Assistant Clinical Professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health in Columbia University and Chair of the Global Climate Change and Health Committee of the Environment Section at the American Public Health Association. She is among the scientists who participated in the IPCC, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report back in 2007. She joins us to discuss global warming, a matter of health. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Kim Knowlton. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Pat. Thanks to the Cambridge Forum for inviting me and for my fellow scientists who have spoken before for their incredible work and to everyone listening here, to everyone listening on the radio for your attention because our full attention is very much what is needed to direct at this issue and toward this fact that global warming is indeed a matter of health. And I'd like to talk just a little bit about that. And also to remind us of this, that we do have the means right now through legislation, through technological innovation that is in our hands to transform the energy systems that we use towards clean, non-polluting sources that can create a healthier, safer, cleaner environment. And later this afternoon, this evening, Andre is going to be speaking. Andre Zaleska will be talking a little bit about roles of citizen activism along with Ken Ward and talk about what people can do in that regard moving toward action. But I want to talk about health because I'm a health scientist. I know that you have a lot of expertise here in Cambridge and probably right here in the room, a lot of knowledge. I want to share with you what I know about global warming and its health impacts. Global warming has far-reaching effects on health. It worsens a range of health impacts and health problems that already exist with us, and it increases the severity of those current health risks. It, they really vary depending on where you live. So different communities will face different relative health effects that are more dependent on the geography of where they live. Let me give you a, a sort of sense of the range of climate sensitive health impacts, some of which have already been mentioned today. Heat waves, ozone smog, ground level smog, longer pollen seasons that can cause allergies, allergic reactions, wildfires, extreme weather events, floods and droughts, increased food and water contamination that can lead to diarrheal illnesses, vector-borne diseases that are moving into new geographic areas that are affected by these climate changes and other human activities. I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. And remember, too, that climate-related disasters are having significant, harmful, long-term effects on mental health. We're discovering this in the aftermath of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita here in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. Most certainly, we see that today. We have to remember that global warming has a human face. Now, I don't have some of the you know, really compelling pictures and graphics that the, the previous speakers had. And that means that our, our radio companions aren't going to miss anything, but I'm going to have to ask everyone here in the room and elsewhere to really try and capture these faces of people affected by global warming in your mind's eye. I want to share with you these facts. Fact, the World Health Organization estimates that already more than 150,000 deaths each year are due to climate change effects on malaria, malnutrition, and gastrointestinal illnesses. That's today. Fact. During 2003, Europe had a two-week heat wave that killed more than 35,000 people, more than 35,000, with France bearing the brunt of fatalities at 15,000. Here in the U.S., by 2050, heat-related summer mortality in New York City is projected to double. By the 2080s, Boston could see two months of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. 
In Philadelphia, an entire summer of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit has been projected by the 2080s. Fact, 110 million Americans live in areas with both unhealthy summer smog and ragweed, which is a plant, a fairly common plant, but whose allergenic pollen can make late summer quite unbearable when it's combined with smog. Late summer is the season when both ground level smog and ragweed pollen are high in the air. Due to global warming, eastern U.S. cities have been projected to see 68% more unhealthy smog days by 2050 as temperatures rise. Lab studies have shown that ragweed could produce 320% more pollen under those higher CO2 levels. Now, I mentioned sort of at the beginning of the, this fact section, global warming's human face. There are many members of the public who, who see global warming as primarily affecting sort of the image of polar bears, a polar bear struggling to survive on a melting ice flow. Certainly, the ecosystem effects of melting polar ice are devastating, are extremely important, in particular, not only to ecosystems, but to human populations in the Arctic who survive uh, on polar bears, other mammals, for food supplies, for great you know, subsistence. But I would propose, as has been suggested by experts at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that besides the polar bear, another image, another face attached to the health effects of climate change could be that of an asthmatic child struggling to get a lungful of air. That's because as temperatures get hotter and worsen smog pollution and higher carbon dioxide makes pollen production worse, particles emitted along with global warming pollutants as we burn fossil fuels present a triple whammy, unfortunately, to the health of the estimated 7 million children and 16 million adults with asthma in the U.S. Those are the faces of global warming. Fact, 173 million Americans in 28 states now live in counties with one or both of the mosquitoes that can carry dengue fever. This is a potentially devastating viral illness that's increased globally some 30-fold in the last 50 years. Fact, storms with extreme rain have increased 24% in the U.S. in the last 60 years. These extreme rain events can wash pathogens into drinking water supplies. One of these waterborne illness outbreaks in Milwaukee sickened over 400,000 people in 1993 and resulted in 69 deaths. One study of global warming in the Great Lakes that projected to the end of the century looked and projected that those kind of disease-causing flood events could possibly double in frequency by the end of the century as temperatures rise and heavy rainfalls increase. Fact, the dry western U.S. states are already seeing less snowfall and reduced summer stream flows in the last half of the 20th century. Warmer spring and summer temperatures since 1987 have been associated with a fourfold increase in wildfires. And those are wildfires that burn more than an acre and a half of, of territory. And the smoke from these fires can have substantial effects on respiratory health hundreds of miles downwind. Fact, outside of the US, last October saw devastating flooding in India that left one and a half million people homeless and five million people without food. Now, while we cannot say that these events were all a result of climate change, some at the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center have noted that sudden swings from drought periods to flood periods, like those India experienced, are consistent with projections of climate change weather patterns. And the last fact, too, that sort of encapsulates much of these other pieces of information an estimated 6,500 climate-related disasters have occurred since 1980. That's a number that's doubled in the last 30 years. By the year 2015, which is right around the corner now, it's projected that worldwide, 375 million people each year could be displaced from their homes by climate-related disasters. Some researchers here in the US have projected that climate refugees, that is those people who whose needs must be met for food, shelter, for sustenance, 
could be the biggest impact, the biggest health, biggest social, the biggest environmental justice impact of global warming that we will be faced with. Okay, now, unfortunately, these people, some of whom are most vulnerable to those impacts, are those who can least afford another assault on their health. Women and children are among those who are most at risk. Some of the other vulnerable, most vulnerable to climate change health impacts also include poor communities who don't have uh, extremely uh, expansive financial resources or access to public health infrastructure. City dwellers, where heat and air pollution can be at their worst. Communities of color who tend to live near polluting facilities both here in the US and abroad. Those are among the most climate vulnerable populations. Other climate vulnerable groups tend to be older people, people with breathing or heart ailments, the obese, people with migraines, people who get kidney stones, people who are active outdoors. Have I mentioned anyone that you know, I mean, in this group? These are all people whose health can be especially harmed by the effects of climate change. There are other impacts to this sort of group, this enlarging group of people whom climate global warming affects. There's dollar and cents impacts too. Consider some of these numbers. With colleagues from the California Department of Health, NRDC scientists looked at hospitalizations and emergency room visits during a July 2006 heat wave in the state of California that was so big, in which temperatures were so extreme, it affected essentially the entire state of California. Over the course of just 18 days, there were over 16,000 additional emergency room visits and nearly 1,200 additional hospitalizations across the state at an estimated cost of $133 million. Or consider a 2009 study by the National Research Council. This was done for the US Treasury, which estimated our energy bills in the US are $120 billion higher than they appear due to the hidden costs associated with air pollution created by burning fossil fuels. Over 90% of these hidden costs are due to premature death, implying that at least 18,000 Americans die each year to support fossil fuel use. That's $120 billion right now in unassessed health costs each year from illness and death from harmful health effects of three air pollutants that are associated with fossil fuels, and that's particles, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxides. I mean, this, these dollars are translating into family members, into health, into coughing, wheezing, hospitalizations, or having a shorter life from air pollution. It's time to take action, and the good news is there are tools to avoid these kind of health impacts. I mean, that's sort of the, the counterpoint to a litany of very sobering news that we need to attend to. Attention must be paid. The good news is there are strategies to address this, and there's a great deal of opportunity to take right now. We have at our fingertips some strategies to start to address the climate health crisis that is here, ideas for stabilizing the climate and improving health at the same time. Sometimes you hear people, I'm sure that in this room you, that you have, talk about win-win solutions or health co-benefits, as one of the previous speakers mentioned. Air pollutants like fine particles, air toxic, and smog precursor chemicals are produced at the same time as global warming pollution when fossil fuels are burned. By burning less fossil fuels or driving fewer cars, making more bike or walking paths, or creating more public transit options, we get a double benefit, or this win-win, so-called solution. We get cleaner air and water today. We get a cooler, healthier world, environment, tomorrow for our children and grandchildren to enjoy. When we design communities where people can bike to work, where kids can walk to school safely, and all neighborhoods have options for a fast, inexpensive bus service to get to work or get into the city center, that's a win-win. Your kids have a safe way to get to school, they get more exercise, and we reduce global warming pollution right now and for the future. And the kicker is these healthy solutions save us money in health costs from reduced respiratory illness, asthma, and heart problems that are associated with heat stress and air pollution. And the, the children 
all of us are getting more exercise and helping to prevent obesity and diabetes, which are in a, a national epidemic you know, proportions right now. So with legislation that the Senate is considering, there are opportunities to create new energy and tech jobs right here in America, not overseas, and at the same time limit the amount of global warming pollution and improve health. Health, it's what it all boils down to. It makes sense to reward companies that reduce their pollution and hold polluters accountable. For over a decade, NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, where I work, has been working to stop global warming. There are a set of policy solutions that can halt and eventually reverse this drastic increase in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere and potential increases which have been dramatically discussed by the, the previous speakers and their science. Yet, despite all of these important actions, major disruptions will still occur over the next 20 to 50 years. And that's why preparedness, adaptation is really critical, vital. We can thrive, we can survive, we can seize opportunities. The health and safety of millions of people could be threatened without us taking these preparedness steps. Action is needed today to prepare and protect our health and the planet's health, ecosystem health, for some unavoidable health impacts. The public health community needs to be at the table in writing community and state adaptation plans to prepare for climate change impacts. Four ideas are emerging in climate health preparedness. One, determine who and where the most vulnerable communities live. Two, make sure environmental monitoring and health reporting systems are really strong and well-funded. Three, design buildings and infrastructure to be energy efficient and climate smart. And four, expand climate health education for the public, for practitioners, for uh, professionals nationwide worldwide. Adaptation plans are starting to get underway. For example, over a dozen U.S. cities, including San Francisco, Chicago, Washington, Philadelphia, more, already provide coordinated warning systems and response systems for heat waves that target people who are most at risk from extreme heat. And at the same time that global warming is bringing new health challenges, Unfortunately, budget cuts over the last decade have unraveled dozens of important programs that provide basic health protections in monitoring programs and health surveillance activities at state and national levels. We really need to be sure that these environmental monitoring systems are fully funded, supported, and coordinated with links, animal, human, and environmental monitoring and reporting. Let me give you an example. Dengue fever, which I mentioned before, is a good one. Nearly 4,000 Americans have returned to the U.S. carrying the dengue virus in the 10 years between 1995-2005. When travelers infected with dengue fever import the virus back into the U.S., especially during the warmer summer months when mosquitoes are active, it could increase the possibility of local transmission to other people. We'd like to see more testing of mosquitoes and people in the U.S. so we can know if, when, and where mosquitoes are carrying the dengue virus and if there's a response to climate changes. NRDC has released studies on dengue, pollen, smog, heat, and climate health preparedness, and I invite everyone to access our website, which is at nrdc.org slash health slash global warming. And I'll, I'm happy to share that with people and more information after the talk, too. We also need to address something else, the looming shortage in the public health workforce, which is estimated to be a quarter million shy by 2020. This convergence of a climate crisis striking a weakened health system could really spell serious trouble in the years to come. So the alternative is to take these issues as a fantastic opportunity and mobilize science and this political savvy we have to raise the profile of health issues within this climate debate and help build momentum for a really meaningful greenhouse gas reductions. We need to support the creation of preparedness strategies that plan for the health impacts of global warming 
and we absolutely need to advocate for strong climate health education, professional training, enhanced monitoring, and preparedness funding at all levels of government. There is really strong public health adaptation language and funding provisions in the proposed legislation which the senators on Capitol Hill are now discussing. So, in conclusion, I want to remind you that there is a lot of positive momentum happening now. The public health community is engaged around the world as never before and sounding the alarm on the connection between climate change and health and the need to create a healthier, safer environment for everyone. We're at a critical point in history, absolutely critical. We have the tools to help ourselves prepare for climate change, and this is what international physicians are calling the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. So, with this chance in our hands to help ourselves and our kids and people around the world to improved health, new economic opportunities, and a more secure collective future, let's remember we are not done yet. There was work that was begun just begun in Copenhagen, but as we keep talking, let's also make sure that we get to work and make sure that others stay on track and keep working and working well. Thank you very much. You are joining us at Cambridge Forum listening to Kim Knowlton discussing global warming, a matter of health. The floor is open for questions. Thank you for all that very valuable information about the public health um, effects of global warming. I'm interested because you gave a great statistic about um, number of deaths essentially caused by fossil fuel uh, because they have health effects. Um, what's the number? 18? 18, 18,000. Per year. That was per year. And that was derived from that study. Right. The hidden costs. That's right. I immediately think of the number of deaths caused by automobiles, which is much larger, I think, and I add them together in my head and um, think, okay, at what point do we get to go to the fossil fuel ex extractors and, and uh, you know, the big oil and big coal companies and treat them as we did the cigarette companies because of these deaths? And does NRDC do any work like that or do you know anybody who does? In terms of pursuing litigation, mm -hmm. that is a strategy, I think that there are many strategies being pursued right now, uh, both legislative, in the courts, and uh, you know through uh, regulation, but that is not one on which we are active right now. But I know there's so much in the hopper right now, and some of those, you know, that strategy to pursue, I know that that has been mentioned of late, just in this last week, but that's not one on which we're engaged right now. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you very much, Susan Shamel. Um, I took a lot of notes because I'm really interested in this public health uh, topic. I've, I've worked in a allied health field for years. Uh, my real issue, though, comes back to the political part of it and the political will, and it's this. I wish that doctors would get more vocal about the need for climate change legislation. Um, doctors are very well respected in the community, and it seems like for the great majority, they're pretty much oblivious to this. Um, and as another example, and this isn't a doctor, but a relative of a relative is getting a PhD in public health and policy at Harvard, and when I asked him what he was learning about global warming, he basically said nothing. Um, and I, I would really love to get physicians on board so that they're writing their physicians writing their congressmen, calling their congressmen, um, visiting them. I would love the AMA to come out with a very strong statement. Doctors, even if you go to the Doctors for Social Responsibility, Doctors Without Borders, climate change is not mentioned or it's just one little teeny piece. And I just wonder what we can do to move doctors to act, um, come out vocally, politically, saying to the congressman, we need to act and we need to act now. Because no matter how much mitigation we do, again, we've got to bring that carbon dioxide down and we've got to get a bill passed. So what do you think we can do? Great point. And actually in the last, I would say in the last three years, there's been a sea change in terms of the healthcare professional community really getting on board in terms of speaking out. I think there may have been some inertia around 
those professionals becoming advocates. And it's still a question in many people's minds, but I'm thinking of uh, some positions and you know letters to elected officials that members of the AMA have written that organizations like APHA and other professional organizations, the American Nurses Association, American Academy of Pediatricians have signed on to that are very active now. Um, there are uh, articles in peer-reviewed journals that are authored by uh, professional societies. There was a prominent one in Lancet in the last um, six months. So it is happening publicly that pro professional societies are getting on board. So I can suggest to you, if you want to talk afterward, I can... Yeah, I have one idea that I'll talk to you about later. I'd love to. I'd love to, because it's happening, but it definitely needs to happen in it's more... too slow, and, you know, just talking to people or doctors, they kind of look at you, know, you like... Okay, I think local crazy. really matters. I think in, tra uh, in training local right. doctors, because doctors talk to people right. and really make and a difference respected. with their patients. Yes, Thank yes, you. I think that's a great idea. Yes, uh, I've been a member of the National Resource Defense Council for many, many years, very actively supporting it because of its overall umbrella concept of protecting our natural resources. And this is very, very important to me because I live in a city and we have a lot of natural resources. Unfortunately, they happen to be on the borders of the city and they're regional. So when you start talking about our potential, our, our for certain flooding in the future and our increase of ragweed and what's going to happen when the climate warms up, uh, the solutions for those particular areas very often are very different than they are in city where we, you know, have our urban forests, but in the outside of our cities we have our larger issues of watersheds and flooding issues. Now, we, you didn't go in at all to issues of solutions when it comes to urban natural resource protection because very often those two areas get conflicted and it's, it's difficult to handle both at the same time. But maybe you can help uh, as you go around and talk and do your research as to how do you bridge the gap between the urban uh, metropolis and the urban wild and how do we work together on that. that that's been a great difficulty here in our city and I think in other places as well. Thank you. Sure. Oh, so many things come to mind when you say that. Um, so it's a great question. Thanks for the question. I think it's just a matter of time limitation that I didn't talk more specifically about that because uh, one thing that comes to mind is that regional planning, of course, makes a lot of sense because the city to the, the, the areas around the city, the suburbs to the Sur uh, the surrounding countryside can be seen as one entire region that makes a lot of sense since people who live outside of a city proper often work within. So you can uh, connect, you know, what's happening within a whole area and talk about how an entire urban region responds. That's one thing. Maybe it makes more sense to look at an entire urban area. Two, in terms of the ragweed, in fact, that's something that is found quite often within urban areas because it loves to grow in urban lots, abandoned urban lots in the cracks of sidewalks. So it's interesting that the ragweed pollen bearing, you know, weed problem is quite an urban phenomenon as well as a more rural and, you know, suburban issue too. That's one thing. Many of these uh, issues, health issues that sound like they're for outside of the city also bear on an urban population as well. But NRDC, the, the last point, uh, that we have an urban, an urban program that's very much about urban health planning and an air and energy program that is really directed at thinking how to integrate climate and health and urban issues. So we're, we're thinking actively about that. And I think that the website I, that I suggested will have more about that, or I'm happy to talk more. We can talk after the. Thank you. Thank you. Ambrose Spencer from Cambridge. I want to thank Tim Weiskel for having taught a wonderful course at Harvard Night School trying to turn ordinary people into uh, citizen scientist advocates. I have a question about uh, the church. Uh, Christians and their tradition is more associated with people hugging than tree hugging. And uh, there's Creation Care magazine and there's some activity at the National Council of Churches. But what I'm wondering is, 
um, what organizations do you work with at NRDC to, to try to encourage a much b more broad uh, Christian recognition of the facts and the condition that faces us that Jesus Christ would be appalled at. I'm wondering uh, how we can get the full spectrum of the Christian church all the way from the new church, Pentecostal holiness, all the way to uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox uh, on board this assault on human health, uh, damage, harm, hazard, destruction to, to our children and our grandchildren. It's something they ought to be concerned about and you have the facts, but I'm wondering what organizations NRDC might have become aware of who are taking point on this uh, so that perhaps the few in the audience who share this particular concern I bring uh, might get in touch with them and, and learn the dialectic and cracking this particular part of the code to use Tom Hartman's language. Uh, that's a great point because I know that the faith communities have been a really potent and a very you know rich partner with a lot of people doing climate and health work. I know that Paul Epstein, who's here, a very prominent climate and health researcher, has great collaborations, very rich with the faith communities. But the project that I work on, as yet, we don't have like active collaborations, but I would be very interested in investigating that. I mean, ours is, you know, our project is growing, but as yet, I haven't looked into that fully, but I'd love to talk with you about that more. Thank you. Sure. I'm Roger Shamel with Gwen, the Global Warming Education Network out in Lexington. I want to thank the Cambridge Forum and you for speaking about the health impacts of climate change. My question relates to the huge disconnect between what scientists and people such as yourself are telling us versus what the public understands. And Jim Hansen, who I believe is speaking tonight, alludes to this disconnect. I'm personally a scientist, but I know someone in my extended family who thinks of science as a belief system, which I don't understand. Um, but, but the question is, given all that you're telling us about health and the fact that most Americans don't seem to be concerned about this, I'm wondering if you can suggest anything or do anything as part of NRDC to help get the message out to the average American, whether it's Joe Sixpack or Mary the beautician, that what's coming down the pike is really much more serious than what they seem to understand and that it would be worth making this transition away from fossil fuels that are gonna run out eventually anyway to avoid these problems. What can we do to get the message out to, to break the gridlock that we seem to be stuck in? I look to you more, I think, than you look to me for that answer because I've been doing that for the last few years and part of the dilemma, I think, is this. What the science, coming from both peer-reviewed journals, as was mentioned you know, previously earlier this afternoon, what we bring forward from those fre too frequently, or let's just say frequently, I think, are scenarios that are quite compelling but very sobering. And we take them into the, you know, the public sphere and we take another, we bring another, the facts I brought forward. Taken together, they're you know, cause for concern, but they can be rather, the gravity of those can make people turn off instead of opening their minds to more information. So part of the, the question, the communication question is how do we leaven what we need to pay attention to with what we need to take action on so that there's a balance like attention must be paid let's act on it so that we can move forward so it, instead of just being mired in too much it's just let's move let's go forward health it's over there let's go and I think it's it's really the public the educated public that can help scientists understand what's the balance because we absolutely need to get going and go towards health we can't stay mired where too frequently we get to um so that's why the 
the message about the tools we have in hand, but it's attention, it, 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 T-E-N-S-I-O-N. There is attention there, um, and we're figuring out how to, how to get to movement, forward movement. And we're doing what we can, of course, and since you threw it back to me in a way as to what to do, what my suggestion is that all of us who are concerned about this, whether citizens or scientists or businessmen, try to get our fairly newly elected president, who just spoke last night, to get the message to the people, whether it's through speeches by himself or John Holden, his science advisor, or Steve Chu, his secretary of energy, or even paid ads by the government that reach Joe Sixpack while they're watching Biggest Loser, or whatever the show might be, because I'm really concerned about this, mostly as a parent and grandparent, that my kids don't need to be facing this threat because we're too um, uneducated about the problem. So that's my suggestion to everyone here. That's Reach out idea. and tell people. I like your idea. Thank you. My question, I think, follows on the previous question a little bit. Lots of the early information, those early studies that you talked about piling up, dealt with places that were far away and diseases that were far away from America and Western Europe. And I wonder what kind of pattern you see in terms of bringing more stories of change close to home out. I mean, you had information about emergency room visits, but what, what is happening in terms of bringing the idea of my health in Massachusetts or Louise's health in Paris being affected by climate change. I think that the the research, the body of research, is strongest in terms of the effects of heat on health, climate change on heat on health, and air pollution. Climate change, air pollution, in particular, ozone smog, and health. Um, carbon dioxide, a major global warming pollutant on pollen-bearing weed species like ragweed. We're learning about that, but from lab and field studies, there's some really compelling evidence. And certainly, allergens have such a direct effect on health. So there's really interesting new work and a lot of attention being paid there. Infectious diseases in the field, because those are complex systems with a lot of environmental and human determinants that go into those systems, those are more complex to really see the, you know, the effects of environmental change one to one to one because they're so multifactorial. So those are more complex. So I would say heat, air pollution, probably aeroallergens are at the top of the list for our best understood. And then uh, rainfall, the effect of climate change on rainfall is in climate models and future models a little bit more elusive because of our understanding of the atmosphere itself being more elusive in the physics of the atmosphere. So flooding, storm events, and the health effects that then follow is also more elusive to project. Kim, the one thing that uh, sort of builds on what was said this morning, especially the map we had of Cambridge uh, potentially underwater, I remember we had recently that map shown on the wall with a public health specialist in the room who said um, kind of out loud, at least a lot of us heard it, do you guys realize what rats and mice do in reference to uh, rising water? <clears throat> and someone sort of chirped up from the back of the room, well, that MIT's underwater, but Harvard's above it, as it were. Um, <laughs> to which someone else responded, we always wondered why all the rats ended up at Harvard. <laughs> um, to which the response was, well, maybe not all of them. One of them jumped ship last year. Larry Summers left, I guess. But um, the, the question of the vector species, which you raised, uh, mainly in reference to uh, dengue fever and the mosquitoes, is multiplied by other vector species, including for example, every time there's a wildfire in California, a great out-migration of rodents from canyons 
some of which carry the, the plague quite readily into urban and suburban areas. Um, and I think public health people have a vocabulary to talk about uh, interspecies interaction in a way that the rest of us haven't yet developed. But to keep the focus on um, monitoring, as it were, the humans, vectors, and infections simultaneously as the parameters are shifting, I think is a very powerful way to go. And I, I look forward to many more of your, your uh, publications from yourself and colleagues on this, because once you publish them in peer-reviewed journals, we can start to talk about them in fora like this. We just had a paper that came out in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in the January, February 2010 issue on just that topic called the Climate Wildlife Human Nexus on the connection between climate change, animal and human illnesses. And it's very readable, it's very accessible. And, and there's a lot of interest in the different federal agencies on the need to make those connections. So it's a very timely subject that you bring up. Okay. Thank you well, for bringing gonna, that up. We can post that, as you've mentioned it, up on the website we're putting together for these uh, exchanges, climate-research.tv, if you're interested. I'm afraid this is not exactly a question. I'm sharing a research, resource. Um, there's an organization called the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions, CRED, associated with Columbia University that has put out a really very useful, well-designed um, guidebook for press and other people who are doing public presentations on how to talk about climate change. It's www.columbia.edu slash cred, C-R-E-D. It's a 47-page free download. <laughs> no, but... Um, Gee, I would like to. No, I'm, I'm, using, I'm using the book because I'm becoming more active and I want to do more speaking, and it's, just, great. it's just what I Thank need. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for everyone, from everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation and telling us so much about health and climate. And uh, I'm here for the same reason, to really give a resource, because uh, one gentleman was wondering if there's not a, an organization here in Massachusetts that um, is an interfaith organization or Christian organization and looking at the issues of climate. And I wanted to tell you about uh, Mass Interfaith Power and Light. Um, you can find us. You can find us on the internet at, I, I'm on the executive committee. My name is Susan Almano, and I have my card so you could get my, our website, but it's M-I-P-A-N-D-L dot org. And um, what we primarily do is go to different faith communities. We are a membership organization, but we go to faith communities and we talk about climate change and what can be done in your faith community, mostly energy efficiency work. Um, we are capable of coming out and doing what we call an environmental stewardship assessment, which is um, an energy audit, and helping to find the financing to get the work done. Um, but we do much more as well. We also um, work in the area of promoting legislative change, policy change, and are working on creating a green jobs um, training program in lower income communities starting in Lawrence. So it's a very good resource to start to, to do this work of what can we do. And I know this is probably going into what our next session is about, but um, you know, addressing these issues through faith communities is something that is being done in Massachusetts. Okay, please join me in thanking Kim Holton. Thank you. <laughs>